today's scripture comes from John chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. These things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. This is the word of God. Man, this is the only answer and the best advice I can leave with you all. And that is be filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I truly believe that we are living in the times when we are even one day more closer than yesterday, right? We're one day more closer than yesterday was to seeing Christ return. Think about it in that perspective. We're waiting really to see Jesus come back and rule and reign and make all things right again. And so in light of what is to come, I really, as a pastor, I want to leave only with the best for you all. That's beyond singleness. It's beyond your career trajectory. It's beyond even marriage. And that is that we are empowered and filled By the Holy Spirit. And so today's context, or the context of today's scripture in John chapter 16, it's part of what we call the Last Supper discourse or the final discourse of Jesus. Uh, And and really, it's the last part of his teachings before Jesus goes to the cross. And so these chapters include John chapter 14, John chapter 15, John chapter 16, and also John chapter 17. This is all encapsulating the time that Jesus spent with his disciples during the Last Supper. And during this time, he is really pouring out his heart. He's sharing what is to come. And he doesn't sugarcoat any of this. And I want you guys to capture this, even though it sounds really good that we're kind of hearing like, oh yeah, the helper will come, be filled, and you know, it's good that I leave. But in in light of what he's sharing is is that people are going to kill you. They're actually going to kill me. I'm going to be taken away from you, and I'm going to go to a place where you cannot come right now. But don't lose heart, because I promise the helper will come to you. You see, for the disciples, even though they might have not fully grasped what was taking place, at this point in their walk with Jesus, they kind of understood, is he really saying he's going to go and die? It's kind of sinking in now. They don't really know to what degree and to how it's going to all pan out, but what they realize is Jesus is pretty explicit on saying, I will no longer be with you. And this is really disheartening. Just think about it in the disciples' shoes. You've left your jobs. You've left your careers. You've even left your family to some degree. And you've dedicated the last three years of your life on following Jesus, this man, wherever he went. Wherever he went, you followed. You went with him. And now he's coming to a place saying, I'm leaving you all. Just think about what is really happening in the disciples' hearts. And I think when you really, when I think about that, it's like very uncertain. 
uncertainty, insecurity. Kind of like you're feeling like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen now? You know, there, there could be a sense of that even as Pastor Keith is retiring and Pastor Sung is kind of stepping in. Or maybe another transition of like you are, maybe when you left high school and you went into college for the first year. Or you started a new job and the old boss that favored you and loved you and took care of you is no longer with you anymore. It's kind of that sense of feeling like you're alone. Maybe abandonment. It's not a positive feeling. But the context of that is that Jesus assures the disciples that they will not be left as orphans. I didn't put this on the scripture, but John 14 verse 1, if you look at the beginning of the discourse, he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. What is Jesus preparing the disciples? He is saying, do not be gripped by fear. Do not allow the things that is to come in this life to grip you in, under fear, to isolate you and to really minimize or limit you from doing God's work. He says, believe in God. And I thought this was so interesting because Pastor Keith this morning in the first two services talked about fear. And he says the fear of danger or, or people really seeking security. As, as like the highest priority as parents. Like when they look at their kids, all they think about is parent, um, safety. And you know, I, I'm guilty. I, I, I live in a little, you know, community and I yell at my kids all the time. Literally every time they ride their bikes, they, they go, on, go on their bike from the garage. There's a little slope and guess what they do? Every, any kid would do this, right? I, I did this. You go down that little hill and you go directly into what? The pathway of the the neighborhood streets where the cars go. And guess what we do all the time? Stop! Look both ways! And obviously, do kids look both ways? For 90-some percent of the time, they don't. They're just going, because why? It's fun. But here I am yelling at their face. And man, I had a handful of them where I was like, you need to look both ways, okay? And they're like, okay. <laughs> they're like, I'm just getting on a bike, going down this. I'm like, look both ways. That's the type of parenting <laughs> I'm guilty of doing. And Pastor Keith was talking about this. And he talked about fear of danger causes people to seek safety. Fear of da danger causes people to seek safety first, which first, which in turn makes us to suffer mental illness or a life of enslavement, always seeking for security. And he really encouraged us, the church, to live not sheltered in safety, but take risks. Take risks. Be risk takers. And I thought that was so kind of aligned with this because the disciples are now hearing that Jesus is no longer going to be with them. That they're going to be alone. They're going to have to figure things out on their own. And see, I think you might be in a situation where you can kind of relate. Maybe you feel a little bit out of place. Maybe you're in a life transition in your life currently. Maybe you're not having the best time at your work. Maybe you're having a difficult time finishing semester or your quarter at school. Maybe you're going through a very difficult turmoil at home. And you might not feel like I feel secure. And so in that situation, a lot of times we have two choices. We could either try to figure it out and take control over our lives and do whatever it takes to kind of minimize a sense of insecurity or this havoc or chaos and we try to take control and matters into our own hands or we can retreat completely and dis dis attach ourselves dislocate ourselves detach ourselves from all the things and just really go into a dark isolated place but jesus chooses neither he says you must know that i am going to promise you the helper who is going to come and aid you when I'm not here. Jesus provides another way, and that is he sends his Holy Spirit. He sends the Holy Spirit that will ultimately be with you 24-7. Something he couldn't do himself as one physical person on earth, Jesus. So he says, I must leave so that the helper, it is to your advantage. And see, I think it's so interesting because in our lives, when we think about life transitions and when we think about life in itself... Life is difficult. Fallen by nature, there is no true, like, 
solution to things when you look at all the things that's happening over in your life you look at your job you look at the economy you look at your school maybe your grades you have some control but a lot of things outside of your grades you feel like you have no control over and it grips you but could i remind you church my fellow brothers and sisters do not let your heart be troubled do not let your heart be troubled believe in god Believe also in Jesus. Amen. John 14, 16, and 18 says, I, I will ask the Father and he will give you another help, he, helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Amen. You know, there's far too many Christians living like they're orphans. What is an orphan? Someone who doesn't have an advocate for them. Someone who doesn't have somebody that's going to cover and take care of their, have their back in any situation. And a lot of times we live our Christian lives as though we're alone in all this. Even when we look at our church fellow brothers and sisters, we feel like, no, they can't be with me. I don't trust them. Well, I'm here, I go to cell group, I do all these things, I have fellowship, I go out and hang out. But when it really boils down to it, I don't think they're going to be there. You know, that's an orphan mindset. You know why, why they think like that? Why you might think like that sometimes? Because you don't have faith in your own self that you will be there for somebody else. You place your faith in yourself and in people rather than in Jesus Christ, in the Holy Spirit who will always be with you. Amen. When you truly experience the everlasting presence of God through the Holy Spirit in your life, you can really kind of share that with others. You could really be a little bit more assertive and confident that even through difficult times, God is with us. Let your not heart not be troubled. Don't be an orphan. And I'm kind of going over John 14 just to kind of give you an understanding of what Jesus speaks about the Holy Spirit in the previous chapters. He says in John chapter 14, 26 to 27, when the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, bring to your remembrance all that I said to you, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Amen. Where do you find your peace? A lot of times we find our peace in these temporal things. It's an exchange. When we go through hard times, we exchange the difficult things with another thing, like buying stuff or watching stuff, experiencing stuff, having relationships. Whatever it may be, we exchange these deep kind of chaos in our own hearts that we cannot contain or control. We exchange it for temporal release. It could even be substance, alcohol, sexual things. We exchange the glory of God for temporal things. That is what sin truly is. But Jesus says, don't be troubled or fearful. Why? Because I give you a peace that this world could never offer you. Amen. What is that peace, brothers and sisters? That peace is the Holy Spirit. That peace is the presence of God in the Holy Spirit that resides in all believers. Amen. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Really, seriously, we need to take heart in the Lord rather than ourselves. So many times we place our trust in ourselves. And this is such an important emphasis that Jesus mentions here. He says, I must depart. If you look at John 16, verse 7 and 9, he says, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. He says, I must go. And in life, there's going to have to be transitions. These transitions are the times when you're going to actually experience greater growth in the Lord. Amen. So many times we bank on security, consistency, that we don't experience growth. But even with his own disciples, Jesus says, you will experience something completely different. And that is, I'm going to have to leave. No longer will I be with you. Do you remember just a few chapters ago, James and John, the brothers, uh, sons of Zebedee, they're like, Jesus, when you go to your glory, could I get your seat right here on your right and my brother one on your left? 
They're thinking physical reign. That's the Jewish thought of the Messiah. He is going to ultimately come and rule and reign over this physical world, right, as a king. So they're thinking when he rises to the top as the redeemer, as a rescuer, as a savior of the world, the anointed one of God, he's saying, could I sit next to you, right and the left? They had no idea. That Jesus was going to leave and be seated at the right hand of the Father. There's going to be transitions in our lives, brothers and sisters. There's going to be things that you're not going to want to face. But let not your heart be troubled. Because it is to your advantage. That when you feel a little bit of vulnerable and detached, that is when you truly recognize that the presence of God is with you in the Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting that when, we're, when life is good and things are just going well and you're just having a blast coming to church, hanging out, which is great. But do you, do you kind of find it like kind of in a pattern that you don't really see God? Think back in your life. When do you really see God? You know when I saw God? When I was bankrupt in my inner, not physical bank. I didn't file check. You guys are like, what? No, no. When I was bankrupt in my soul. Within my heart, I was bankrupt. I was, I literally, I had so many people that I knew. I'm not saying I had a lot of friends. I just had so many different groups of friends. Always could hang out with this group, that group. And I will remember going home at night and going to bed. And I felt so isolated. And just something wasn't right. And I wasn't going to church at this time. But I knew something was off. And I want you guys to understand, it was, it's in these moments of transitions that God really convicts you of sin. This reality that you're not, you need a savior and you need to believe in Jesus Christ. See, to the unbelieving, I want you guys to think about this. To the, apart from the Holy Spirit, human beings, we, apart from the Holy Spirit, human beings do not understand spiritual reality. The Holy Spirit's ministry is to bring to the world consciousness three things. Correct perception of sin, a correct perception of righteousness, and a correct perception of judgment. Correct perception of sin, correct perception of righteousness, and a correct perception of judgment. And so I want you guys to understand this concept here because the correct perception of sin is not when someone does you wrong. Jesus emphasizes here in John 16 verse 9, or or, or verse, verse 9, concerning sin because they do not believe in me he says that is the greatest sin he says this is a sin that i want the world to know when the spirit comes he's going to convict the world of this correct view of sin and that is you need a savior you need help and you might feel like everything is just falling off everything is just collapsing all around you your family your work life your inner life All that you built up, you might feel like everything is falling. That's not all that bad. Because it's in those moments when you truly weigh out the things of your life. The things that matter and things that really don't matter. The things that should remain and things that really shouldn't remain. You catch me? Jesus says the true correct view of sin is that you need to believe in Jesus Christ whom He gave himself as a sacrifice, as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And I think it's so important that we realize this because Jesus in his first discourse in the Sermon on the Mount, when you see the Gospels, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I love this. Because one way to enter the kingdom of heaven is not because you are good and acceptable and you're a great churchgoer and you look great at Sundays. But it's blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who were able to recognize how poor, wretched, and blind and naked they were. I think this is something that only the spirit could reveal to us. Because without the Holy Spirit, the world, you know what they do with this reality and this self-realization of brokenness and poor, wretched? They fill it up with other facades, just the surface things. They try to make a lot of money. They try to do better positive thinking. They try to enter kind of these spiritual spaces of just meditation. They all It always becomes spiritual, but we try to fill it up with shallow surface things. But the way that Jesus convicts the world of sin, uh, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin is that, hey, 
I know you feel like you're a wreck. I know you feel like everything is falling apart, but take heart, for Christ came for you. Amen? He came to save you. He came to deliver you. He came to show you the way so that you may live for, for the king, for the kingdom. And I think this is such an important piece that we cannot just neglect. Because the reality is that the natural person does not... <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't put this on the slide. For the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. For he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned or aloof. They are blinded spiritually. 1 Corinthians 2.14. When you're in the world and you're going through hardship, all you can do is try to just better yourself. All you can do is just try to get yourself out of that hole. And then you go through that cycle over and over again. But in the Lord... It's in that place of brokenness where God's spirit ultimately is revealed to you. The one who advocates. The one who fulfills our weakness. And I love this. Because the Holy Spirit reveals that this world needs a savior. Holy Spirit reveals that this world needs a savior. So, you know, I want you guys to think about this world, really. Just look, just think about what's happening all around the world. Think about your life. I know it can be overwhelming. One thing that it should point to is that someone needs to do something. And there's a lot of people out there right now even doing a lot of things that they feel like they can do on their own streets, like on their own strength, like going on the middle of the street, doing other things, making certain situations known. And you know what? They're doing what they feel like they need to do. But for the church, for us, that when the Spirit reveals His heart, the first thing is that we recognize that there is a Savior who loves you just the way you are. And you know, that's something that I can really attest to. And I really, that's one thing that changed my life completely. I looked at the church from the outside, always thinking, like, I got to be a certain way. Like, I have all these checkboxes. I got to quit this, change this. I got to look this way. I got to do these, these, these in order to be part of the church. And man, was I wrong. I realized that the church is truly a hospital of sinners. One day, a pastor shared that. And it just really made sense that we have a bunch of sinners being saved by the Holy Spirit through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You belong to Jesus. And so many of you guys are trying to live like orphans, trying to figure it out, trying to save your own selves. But in reality, in your brokenness, Jesus is saying, come, come to me. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. I think one of the next part with the Spirit when it convicts the correct view of sin is that the, in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation, but a sorrow of the world produces death. And I think this is an interesting way that Paul writes this because he is saying when the Spirit convicts you of your sin, one thing that you're going to feel is like, man, I am undone. I am so far from being next to God. I feel like I am the last person that God will love. And you might really feel that at that moment when, you, when your sins are just revealed right before your own eyes. And you're like, man, I don't deserve it. But guess what? God produces a repentance through the Holy Spirit without regret leading to salvation. Because when you realize that, for us, because the Spirit is doing the work, there is a Redeemer. There is a way out. There is, a, the, there is the work of the cross. He is pointing to Jesus saying, believe in Jesus who paid for your sins, who died for your sins, who rose again from the grave to give you hope. This is our testimony. But you see the latter part, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Ultimately, if you're in the world without the Holy Spirit, all you have is your own ego. And I think the best example of this is Judas Iscariot. When he commits and denies Jesus three times, not three times, but he denies, he sells Jesus out. Ultimately, he takes his own life. Because he couldn't handle and face the reality of his own failures. So what he can do is just take his own life. It was all under his own control. But look at Peter. 
he denies Jesus three times. And he, he just departs from Jesus. He's like, I don't away with me. I don't know this man. But you know, Peter is restored. Why? Because even though he was God, he was sorrowed and he was grieved of his actions, Jesus received him back. And so many of you guys, when we fall into our own troubles and difficult times, do you draw closer to God? Or do you disqualify yourself and stay stray further from God? You have to distinguish this. Because if you're straying further from God, most likely that's the work of your flesh. That's your own ego talking. You don't, it doesn't look like it on the surface, but that's your own pride. But the true work of the Holy Spirit, the true conviction of sin is that he will always bring you closer to Jesus. Amen? Amen. And he leads us to the tr correct view. <clears throat> what is this? Yes. I'm not there yet, but I don't know why that's coming up. And he leads us to the correct view of righteousness. See, concerning righteousness, he says, I go to the Father and you no longer see me. He says, I must leave. And I'm not going to be with you here, but I'm going to go to the Father. See, once we see our own brokenness from sin, we are able to clearly see Christ's righteousness. Where is Christ right now? Is he on the cross? By no means. Our Lord is next to the Father, seated at his right hand. He is reigning as a righteous king. You, when you realize the correct view of yourself in sin, you also recognize the spirit convicts you of the correct view of righteousness. And the righteousness is not your own. It is truly the righteousness of Christ. I, 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 put, I didn't put this on the slide, but 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. You know what this verse is essentially saying? It's saying that God the Father treated his son Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago on the cross as though he should have treated every one of you and me as sinners. So that today, for those who believe, to those who believe and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, he treats us as the perfect child, as though he, he, we're like Jesus. Why? Because Christ's righteousness covers us today this is the right view of righteousness when we have a wrong view of righteousness we're always going to try to cover it and make a facade just this shallowness of religiosity we're always going to try to look good in front of people we're always going to try to serve and be part of the church join this cell join that group do all these religious things but true righteousness is not our works True righteousness could only come from the righteousness of Christ himself. This is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It only makes me realize how far and wretched and blind that I am. But yet, praise be to God. Because I have an advocate. I have a savior. I could only point the way to Jesus. And I think so many times the enemy thwarts us and makes us believe how insignificant and how isolated, how wretched and, and, and poor and blind you are. And he isolates us from this truth. But the reality is the Spirit of God convicts us into true righteousness. And that is we are covered in Christ's righteousness. Amen. You're not alone. You're not that bad. Now you are that bad, but Christ covers you. We are pretty bad. I'm not going to take that away. We're pretty wretched, guys. When you really un un reveal the things of our heart, when the Spirit reveals, we're pretty far off. But praise be to God because he didn't leave us as orphans. He sent his helper, the Holy Spirit, to reveal these things to us. And I love this because he also reveals the correct view of judgment. John chapter 16, verse 11. And concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. Amen. You know, not only did Christ redeem our brokenness through his righteousness, he judged the ruler of this world. Amen. You know, a lot of people think Satan and God are equals, but he's not. They're not. God is God and Satan is his creation. And Christ ruled 
and he judged that ruler. He disarmed. In Colossians 2.15, sorry, I, my slides might be, oh, oh, no, I don't see it here. But Colossians 2.15, <coughs> Colossians 2.15, it says, when he had disarmed the rulers and the authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them, o- over them through Jesus. Amen to that. Because so many of you guys feel helpless from your struggles of sin. So many of you guys feel like, man, I cannot continue to grow. Why? Because I cannot overcome this sin. But guess what? You were never meant to overcome your sin. Christ overcame your sin, our sins. Amen? And it is through our faith in Christ that we could live obediently, full of the Holy Spirit, living for Jesus. You need to stop giving yourself enough credit. You need to stop trusting your own flesh like you should do better. You need to just fix your eyes on Jesus and live through faith in in Christ who dwells in us and through the Holy Spirit. And that was a lot of mix and jumble with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Sorry for that thing. But we must recognize that the Spirit of God is with us because Christ judged the ruler. He judged the ruler of this world. He disarmed Satan. That all he can do is deceive you and make you believe in lies that is not true. You belong to Jesus. Christ's righteousness covers you. And not only that, Christ judged the ruler of this world. Therefore, you and I could live victoriously by the power of God. And I, I put 2 Corinthians 3, 2 and chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, because it's Paul writes, you are the letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are the letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of human hearts. Amen. You know, Paul says, you know, God doesn't just reveal his love and, and this truth just on his own. He can, but he uses the bride, the church. He uses you. He uses us. The poor, wretched, blind, the brokenhearted, the broken spirited. He uses you to share this great news that truly we are covered by Christ's righteousness and that the ruler of this world has been judged. He uses the church, you and I, to share this good news to the world. Why do you think he does that? He does that because. His name is only more glorified. All the more, he, he, it's, it's, his name is lifted up. You know, when I share the gospel, I don't say, well, look what I did. I've achieved this, and I'm this person here, and I, I've achieved all this here. When I share the gospel with people, especially during food pantry, as we pray for people and, and they come through the doors, I generally share, I was a wretched sinner. <laughs> I didn't really seek God. When my friends invited me to church, I heard the gospel, and for some reason, on that moment, Jesus' righteousness made sense to me. His sacrifice, his atonement, his death on the cross, his resurrection on the third day, just all sank into my heart. And I knew at that moment that I needed a savior. Before that, I think I understood that this world was a really messed up place. And I just didn't care about the world. I was like, man, everyone in this world is messed up and they're living for themselves. So I'm going to live for myself. It was all like, just get mine. Be safe. Just get what's mine and just try to live for me. But when I heard the gospel, I truly understood that God had actually made a way. God had a purpose and a plan. And he executed that plan and purpose through his son, Jesus Christ. And the work of the Holy Spirit today is fully at work today. And I think some of us as, the, as, as fellow believers of Jesus, as disciples of Christ, we must realize that we need to continue to grow closer to God. One way you're going to do that is really share the gospel. You need to put yourself out there to share this truth, this message that saved your life from darkness into his marvelous light. I want to really empower you guys. See, the work of the Holy Spirit is truly the one that's softening up people's hearts, allowing people to really understand what you're sharing about Jesus. Amen? It's not your words. 
It's not your words that's going to save somebody. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. But God uses you. Broken people, weak people, people who are afraid. Why? Because ultimately God receives the glory. We don't get that glory. We get to share in that glory, but God receives all the glory. I think this is an amazing opportunity for us as Church of Southland to really pray for our non-believing friends, coworkers, and our neighbors. I really believe as we are drawing closer to Christ's return, we need to be all the more alert spiritually to pray. We could only pray. If we truly believe that the work of salvation is truly on God's hands, and even though he uses us, ultimately it's the work of the Holy Spirit that convicts the world of sin, judgment, and right, uh, righteousness and judgment, then we, our part is to truly pray. Pray for them. Give it to the Lord. Recognize that to God that we are helpless, but through God, all things are possible. See, to the church, he goes on to say, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit is an essential part of your daily life. When you try to do it on your own, all you're going to be full of is your fear, of your doubts, of all the things that you feel like you just don't have the capacity or the room or just even the knowledge to do. But do you remember what I shared from John 14? Jesus says to the disciples, all the things that I've shared with you, the Spirit will remind you of these things. Amen? Amen? It is the work of the Spirit that will bring you to remembrance. It's going to be, you know, I really believe God will remind you of the things that you heard when you were a child. Maybe it was a VBS retreat. Maybe it was an Awana thing. But something's going to come back to you. Why? Because it is His work. To bring you back to remembrance of truth. And not only that, how do we really harbor and share this love with others around us? Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. I want you guys to think about your life as we kind of conclude and, and close in, in this message. Would your life look different if the Spirit of God is not with you today? Would your life look any different than what it is today if the Spirit of God just all of a sudden left us, left you? Would you still do the same things? Would things remain? Would you still be here every Sunday sitting where you're sitting? How would it look different? How would it be different? Would you just still be that courteous, nice person to your neighbor, you know, neighbors, coworkers, and all these things? We must recognize, brothers and sisters, that the Spirit of God is yearning and moving and empowering us to be light and salt to this world. We're here today to be that light and salt to the ends of the earth. There's no other purpose. It's not that I could just enjoy my life and just have my family and just be all cocooned up in my own life. Christ compels us. He leads his church, his bride into his glory and do you could i just recall this passage in john chapter 16 he tells his disciples you will be killed you'll be taken to places you'll be scourged out of the 12 disciples one betrayed him the 10 were all martyred and john the apostle died at an old age This message of the Holy Spirit came to the disciples in a very distressful time. The Holy Spirit just doesn't come to make us feel good or make us shed some tears during a retreat. The Spirit comes and convicts us of sin. Where we miss the mark, where we are truly just living according to the flesh. The Spirit of God comes to convict us of Christ's righteousness, not your own, not my own righteousness, but Christ's righteousness, and ultimately of judgment. So it re reminds us of what is to come, that he's going to come back to reign and rule. The Spirit leads us and empowers us to live a life sharing the gospel as God's people. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, that you are not your own? 
for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Amen. We must really consider these words. Are you truly living by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the presence of God dwelling in you, giving his peace over you, and leading you into truth? Or are you just living your life casually, like a good old American, enjoying your freedoms, enjoying your rights? If the Spirit truly left you, would your life look any different today? Because the reality of the Spirit is Romans 8, 11, Paul writes to the church of Rome, but the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Amen. This means that we don't put confidence in our own flesh or in our own self. We put our confidence in the Lord, in the Holy Spirit. Amen. This means that we live by faith in the Son of God. Not just by circumstance. Not just by our own security, the sense of security that we want. But we do take risks. We live in obedience because that's what the Spirit does through us. The Spirit brought Jesus back to life. I really want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, that God is the one who will give you this strength. He will give you this peace. Not the, the peace that the world could ever offer you. Because too many times we exchange our troubles with the worldly peace. Temporal peace. Temporal joy. Temporal comfort. And we're always striving to get more and more each day by making more money, by getting a different, going into a different relationship, or even by going to different churches, from this church to that church after a few years after another. We're always searching to satisfy, to fix this inner chaos in us. But the only solution you ever and you and I have is being filled by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We must ask for the Lord to come and fill us. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. But as it is written, things which eye has not seen, nor ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, that God, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit, For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. We need this place where the Spirit truly ministers. We need to make space for God to speak to us. And Pastor Keith really encouraged us today in the early morning, this morning service, to go and just spend time with God. No phones, no praise music, no playlists, just the Bible and you. And one of the things that he said that I thought was so funny is that when you do that, first thing you're going to realize is you're going to be bored out of your mind. You're going to be so bored. And man, I know that bored. And you're like, oh my gosh, you almost don't know what to do. You're like reading the Bible. You're flipping through the pages and you don't know what to do. But as you go through that and you endure and you go past that, the spirit opens the heavens. And the depths of God is revealed to you. This is something that the world can never do. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. He convicts you. The right view of conviction of sin, the right view of conviction of righteousness, the right conviction of judgment really sanctifies us, fills us, and it leads us to truth. Could I have the praise team come up here? We're going to conclude this message as we really kind of go into this time because I want to really take this time for you guys to pray a little bit. To create this space. Are you living by the power of the Holy Spirit? Or are we chasing after fleeting things that's constantly temporarily filling these moments of chaos or the sense of having no control? You know, in 2 Timothy verse 1 through verse 6 and 7, I've been meditating through Timothy and the letters in Timothy, and Paul writes to his young protege. 
he says, for this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and of discipline. If the spirit of God was really to be taken from you, would your life be any different? Would you worry still the same amount? Would you still be filled with all the anxieties of this world? Because the Bible actually says that when the spirit comes, he doesn't give you a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind or discipline, self-control. We must ask for more of his spirit over our lives. We must recognize as the Spirit convicts us, maybe we are searching in all the wrong things to satisfy this sin issue within us. We're trying to cover it up. We're trying to make ourselves look good. We're trying to win the approval of people. But what the Lord wants to do is really fill you up with His presence. He wants to give you a power that this world can never give. That no money could ever buy. No relationship or no person could ever give you. You are his light. You are his salt. You are his bride. We are no longer orphans. We are commissioned to go to the ends of the earth to proclaim the good news of the return of our king. Because when he comes back, he's going to make all things right.